Hello and welcome to the special edition of Footcast Social. Today we have an absolute legend in the house. He's an Arsenal legend, a much decorated England player and now the much cherished voice behind the mic. Joining me from London is the guest Alan Smith. Welcome to the show Alan. Well, Indian fans have been lucky Alan. We started off with Peter Drury, went on to John Champion and now you complete the terrific trio. How has it been for you as a commentator? Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, I always wanted to write about football uh, when I finished playing. I had that in mind. And then so I started doing that straight afterwards for a local London, North London paper, an Arsenal column. And then I started writing for the London Evening Standard and then the Daily Telegraph. I, you know, I had a decent education, so I was in a, a better position than some of uh, my mates in football to do that, I think. And then the uh, the television kind of built up gradually. I knew some people at Sky, having been a guest in the studio when I was injured, when I was still a player. And then I started doing more and more for them when I retired. Um, but it's a big shock when you retire. Any footballer will tell you that. I, I was only 32. I, I wanted to go on a bit longer. Um, but um, I had to turn my hand to something. I, I had to work. I couldn't just retire and sit back. I had to work. So, um, you know, I just got my head down and I've been fortunate in that uh, I have had work to do in all these years since. Well, you started off with radio, then you moved on to television and now the FIFA games. You seem to have an extended run with the football and you've touched so many lives. Does that make you a happy man at the end of the day? Yeah, it's 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 been a surprise, really. I would say, so you know, I didn't expect to go down that road in television, particularly. Uh, I didn't think my character would suit it. So you just never know in this life. Uh, you never know. I didn't think my voice would suit commentary, uh, but you learn to change your voice when you're commentating, uh, to to bring it up and to talk and commentate, shout in a different way. Um, but um, no, I've been lucky. I've had to work. I think you, you must always try and get better, never relax. I listen, listen back to my commentaries. And sometimes you don't know that maybe you're repeating the same phrase or using the same word. So it is handy to listen back to your, your commentaries in order to uh, improve. Um, and that's what I've always done. I've never thought, oh, I've made it. You know, I can just relax and pick up the microphone and say what I like. I've, I've always worked hard at it. Alan, the fans want to know, what is your preparation routine just before a big match on television? Well, yeah, um, as a co-commentator, I wouldn't have as much preparation as Martin Tyler, as Peter Drury, as John Champion. They have to do quite a bit more in order to know about each player and everything about the club and their results. Whereas I... We, we've got a stats team that send through uh, the stats for every match. Uh, so I'll have a look at that. I'll also have a look at the previous games of the two teams, uh, look at the goals and everything, who's scoring, who's right. in form. Uh, have a look at the local newspapers to see what the stories are relating to the two teams. So for me, it's maybe a couple of hours before each match, which is not as much as, as commentators, really. Well, it's May 26th, 1989, and the match against Liverpool. You scored an absolute stunner. Can you take the fans through the entire process? Do you live in slow motion of that particular act? It was. It was a slow motion movement, really. I, I, I'd scored the first one just into the second half, and then we didn't have too many chances after that. Mickey Thomas actually had one that he toe-poked straight at the goalkeeper, Bruce Grobelaar. But um, when I flicked the ball onto Mickey in the dying seconds, I couldn't really get close to him to offer him a pass and neither could anybody else. So we were all watching it. Uh, and I was jogging behind and seeing the, the Liverpool defenders close in on Mickey and thinking he was definitely going to be tackled. So... We were all begging for him to get his shot away before they got in a challenge. Um, and Mickey was such a stubborn lad. He, he never did anything before he wanted to do it. And that, that worked for him brilliantly on the night. And 
when it, when it found the back of the net, you know, we, we've gone to him and congratulated him. Then we've run to the corner of the ground, celebrated with our fans. But then the ref says, oh, get back in your own half. There's still a little bit of time to go. So you think, oh, we've not won it yet. And Liverpool got the ball into our box. And Mickey brought the ball down from a height and passed it back to John Lukic. He was so cool. And then John uh, kicked a long one to me and I just flicked it on. And then the whistle went. And it, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, it gets better the further away you get from it. Um, but at the time, you're in shock a little bit. You can't believe it. But um, I think we all knew at the time that our careers, there would never be a moment as fantastic as that. And that's how it turned out. Well, fans and your co-players believe that this moment will never be repeated in the history of football. Would you believe so? I think in football's lifetime, the Premier League would never allow a game to take place now at the end of the season when everybody else had finished, which is what happened because of Hillsborough. The Hillsborough tragedy, we were due to play Liverpool during the period when all the fixtures were suspended, so it was put to the back of the season. Uh, so everybody had finished. The eyes of the country, maybe the world, were watching us. Um, and it was between the two teams vying for the title. It was a straight shootout. People mm. talk about Manchester City versus QPR in the Premier yes. League. But, of course, QPR was struggling against relegation. They'd had a man sent off. Man City were at home. As was a much more difficult challenge against Liverpool, a team that hardly ever lost, never mind about lost by two goals at home. So that was yeah. the size of the task. And I, I just don't think that moment will ever be repeated. Well, Alan, you were a complete player. You had the ability, skill, stamina and that swirl. Which is the player that comes closest to you when you look at the game today? There aren't, I mean, my sort of centre forward is, I wouldn't say it's gone out of fashion, but the, there are less of us, really. Um, so, um, who's like me now? Like, Liverpool don't have that sort. Manchester City don't. Arsenal haven't. Lacazette is a little bit like me. He plays with his back to goal. Um, Calvert-Lewin, maybe, at Everton. These type of players. But there aren't too many. But I, I, I think there's nothing better than to see quite a tall centre forward, you know, attacking the ball at the far post, heading it in. Um, I don't think it'll ever go out of fashion. But, you know, in football, there are trends and people move away, the false number nine uh, and all the rest of it. But there's nothing like a, a goal scoring centre forward, I don't think. The year is 1988-89 and you had a dream run. You scored 23 goals. How was the moment like for you? Well, I started off well. I scored a hat-trick away to Wimbledon, yeah. uh, which was never an easy place to go. There was such a tough physical side. You had to be prepared to battle. But um, I think we went a goal down. John Fashion, who scored. But then uh, we started playing and I managed to get a hat-trick. So that was a fantastic start for me. Uh, and I remember the journalists outside the dressing room afterwards asking if they thought I was going to win the golden boot as the top scorer. But I said, oh, no chance. Not, not my type of player with my back to goal. I just didn't think it would happen. Um, but um, it was one of those seasons where I didn't really have any droughts. I think the longest I went was four games or something without scoring. Um, so, yeah, I got a couple of goals at West Ham that I really like. Um, that was a good win. Got a diving head at Everton. That, they were all special goals. The young generation of today has only heard of Tony Adams, the player, the skipper. What were the other great qualities that he possessed that made him stand out in the group? He does. He does, Tony, because he, uh, he was a great lad. He was a funny lad. He was just a young boy, really, when, when I first came to the club. Uh, and... Um, we used to take the mickey out of his clothes. He wasn't the best dresser always. Uh, but then he became captain at the age of 21, which was amazing. Um, they took the captaincy off Kenny Sansom, who was an established player in England. 
and Tony's given the armband. So, but he was that type of player that he was. All, he always felt in charge. Anyway, he always felt like a leader. That was his character. Uh, he was very vocal, very loud in the dressing room um, before matches, encouraging us and kind of pumping himself up as well. I think the way he used to shout. But um, yeah, he was a great captain. But most of all, he was he was a fantastic centre half. Um, I would find that out when we would play against the back four in training and what a good player he was. Yeah, fantastic. Where did you get your nickname Smudge from? And what are the other nicknames that you had in your dressing room? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, Smudge is a nickname for Smith. Um, a lot, But a lot of people in England don't know that. They go, oh, why are you called Smudger? And I go, oh, no. I thought everyone knew it was a nickname for Smith. But at Leicester, in Leicester, the nickname for Smith is Smeggy. Um, and I remember when we were with England, funnily enough, me and Tony Adams, we went to watch Watford play on the Saturday. England had the game in the midweek, I think. So we had the Saturday off and me and him went to see Watford play. And then it was against Leicester. And the Leicester fans saw me and Tony. We were sat outside a, outside a, a box. And the Leicester fans started singing, Smeggy, Smeggy, give us a wave. So I went like that and Tony went, Smeggy, why are they calling you Smeggy? And I explained to him, but so he called me that forevermore afterwards, so, not Smudge. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, nicknames. I mean, David Rocastle, a good friend of mine, bless his uh, soul, was, was Rocky. Um, Tony was Rodders, out yeah. of Only Fools and Horses. Uh, so sometimes nicknames change, but um, yeah, not too many rude ones. Your relationship with the most talented Gary Lineker runs back to the Leicester days. What made it so special on and off the field? It was one of those partnerships that uh, clicked straight away. We didn't have to work too hard. Um, I remember uh, there was a pre-season game against uh, a smaller club called Northampton Town and I was playing in the reserves against their reserves on one pitch and the first team were playing against Northampton first team on the other. And our manager called me over at half-time to go on and play for the first team and I scored a hat-trick in the second half next to Gary. I mean, it was normally him scoring hat-tricks and, and me, me maybe getting one, but... Uh, from then on, we started on the first day of the season against Charlton. And um, it, it went on from there because our different styles suited each other. I had my back to goal, flicking the ball on. And he's always on the last line of defence, looking to race through on the, to those flick-ons. So it was, it was quite a natural partnership. And it helped me because it was my first experience of professional football. And to have a partner like that, was great. It got me going. Well, the Indian fans are eager to know about Gary Lineker. What kind of a personality was he? Was he short-tempered or did you have any rough moments with him? No, I mean, I only got booked once and he didn't get booked at all. Uh, so he wasn't short-tempered with a ref. Um, he could, um, you know, if he, if he felt somebody was having a go at him, the coach, whatever, he, he might answer back. Um, but um, no, in the main, he was he was a fairly placid character that was happy if he was getting chances and he was scoring goals. He, he wouldn't moan too much in the way that you do see some players moaning. You know, you, sometimes you see Cristiano Ronaldo going like that. Oh, yes. why haven't they passed to me? He wasn't quite like that. But if the service wasn't coming, he, he obviously wouldn't be happy. He had very high standards. Well... It's a hypothetical situation. What if Ronaldo and Gary Lineker are in the team? They don't get the service, so they don't get to score the goals. And they are irritated. Do you think it affects the morale of the team? Yeah, I mean, they are the best and they would expect the best. Um, but when you're playing with younger players especially, I think you have to be careful. We've seen that at Manchester United sometimes with Bruno Fernandes and Ronaldo and having a go at the younger lads and, you know, their confidence can can take a hit. So you, you've got to be careful with that. Um, but, you know, if you're playing for a big club, uh, you need to uh, come up to that level.
Simple as that. Well, you've watched the game for four decades now, Alan. The players have become rough and the coaches become far more expressive. Do you see that as a big change in the last four decades? Well, it happened with the formation of the Premier League, didn't yeah. it? Um, I, ne I remember the year, what was it, 92, 93, mm -hmm. when we had our names on our backs. You know, we all had squad numbers. The live football came back because there was a period in the, in the 80s when, and the uh, just 1991, where there was no live football on our TVs in England. But then all of a sudden Sky have got involved, big TV rights, and the players are starting to get paid more money. Uh, I mean, I retired in 1995, um, and I remember my teammates, within maybe three, four years, they doubled the wages. Arsene Wenger had come to the club, and he realised how some of those defenders were being underpaid compared with, say, Dennis Bergkamp, David Platt. So their wages went up so quickly. Um, but it, it became show business, didn't it? I mean, it is now. It's Everybody's under the microscope. The camera picks up everything. Um, and you're right, it's not always a good thing. Young players who maybe haven't even played for the first team, they, they're getting paid £10,000 a week or something. And they're coming into training in the best cars and, they lose their hunger a little bit. Some do. They lose that desire, that edge, and a lot never make it. They never, they never move on to the first team. Well, when you're dealing with fans, they want to know the truth. How much were you getting paid while you were playing annually? Well, I think it was probably what Harry Kane's getting paid a week now, 200000 um, which is an incredible thing. I mean, that, that's a lot of money. It, it's a very good wage compared with the average person. But yeah, to think now that, uh, I mean, people are getting paid more than 200,000 a week, aren't they? 350,000, what have you, a week. It, it's incredible. But uh, yeah, that, that was as good as it got for me. Well, do you pinch yourself and say, Hey, instead of retiring at 32, I should have continued till 36, 37. Maybe your daughters would have been happier then? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, uh, because my, my old teammates, the likes of, I mean, you look at the back four, Lee Dixon, Tony Adams, Steve Ball, Nigel Winterburn, I'd, I'd you know, come through with them at Arsenal. Uh, our wages were fairly similar. And then... I can see them earning upwards of a million pounds a year and over. Um, so that, that was quite hard to take, really, because I've retired and it's hard enough not playing football. But then you see your teammates carry on and earning great money, but you can't let it overtake you. Uh, you just have to get on with your own life. How would you reflect at this stage of your life and career, considering that you've spent so much time with the football on and off the field? Yeah, I mean, I, I played 13 years yes. uh, in the professional game, 12 of those in the top division, mm. uh, two league titles, League Cup, FA Cup, European yes. Cup, Winners' Cup, played for England. So you have to think, oh, I've had a great career. Yes, I would love to have played until I was 35, but... Right. After I retired, I heard that the average lifespan of a footballer was seven years, I think it was, which is surprisingly short. But you don't hear about those players, the younger ones that only have a year or two. So you have to be grateful for what you have achieved and, and what you've received, the, the uh, experiences you've had. I, I've just, I just feel lucky that I did have them. Well, Alan, according to you, what is that secret ingredient that allows players to play well beyond the age of 35? Look around, you have players like Ronaldo and Zlatan even going stronger. Well, I mean, the game is quicker, there's no doubt about that, but the tackles don't go in quite so hard these days. Players are protected better by the laws of the game. They don't play with injuries so much, whereas we would grit our teeth and carry on because we wanted to keep our place in the side. It's not quite the same now. Um, but I think the medical side of things has 
transform beyond recognition. Players, training regimes are tailored. You know, if, if a certain muscle needs strengthening, they'll earmark that, make you quicker and stronger. So you, you just looked after better and players look after themselves better off the pitch. They lead a cleaner life now. Yeah. The drink culture isn't within the game in the way that it was in the you know 70s, 80s. Uh, so for that reason, yeah, the science, the science of the game allows players to go on for longer. Well, we are talking of fan connect and this is the time when the players are connected to the fans directly. Do you think it's a positive change that has come from the social media? Yeah, I don't think players enjoy their careers or their lives in the way that we did. We had quite a happy medium. We were very well known, but we could go out. We used to go out um, on a Tuesday, the Arsenal lads, the famous Tuesday club. And we'd go into London We'd go to a restaurant and all sit there around a big table. And one or two people had come over and asked for the autograph, but there were no camera phones then. There was nobody trying to make trouble, no paparazzi. Um, so we, we were able to socialise and meet the fans more. Now I think players, whatever happens, if they go out, it causes headlines. So they end up staying in behind their gated communities it's, you can't blame them for that. Um, so I don't, I, I don't envy them that lifestyle. And if, as you, you mentioned it, Sunny, social media, you know, so many players take notice of what's being said about them uh, on social media, and that can have a negative effect. Uh, so thank God that that wasn't around when I, when I was playing, because I don't think it, it's a force for good. Well, the players have found a way to reach out and meet the fans, but don't you think so? They've lost touch with the journalists somehow. How was it back in your day? Yeah, some of them, we were. it was a bit closer, but you were always suspicious of them. All right. But they were always there. I mean, when I played for England, you'd walk from your room, say, to the dinner table and, and some of the journalists would be stood at the bar and they'd stop you, can we have a quick word? They'd always be stopping in the same hotel, which doesn't happen now. Um, but you're right, you know, footballers can talk to the fans worldwide more. Are they giving a sense of their true selves? I don't know. Or is it the brand they're trying to publicise? For some it is. Um, but we used to go to the player of the year uh, dinner every year in London and chat to the fans. We knew a lot of them by name, really, because we saw them so often. So things, things are much different now. But yeah, they can keep in touch via, via Instagram, what have you. And, and, and that's good for, for supporters. Well, you heard it from the legend himself. That was Alan Smith who joined Footcast Social straight from London. But that's not it all. He will join next week on Footcast Social. This is Sunil Yashkalra signing for Footcast Social. Keep watching NewsX and do stay tuned for Footcast Social next week. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.